Okay, this will be video 1.1 for chemistry. In this unit, we'll talk about measurements and calculations, and we'll show you the units uh, that we use across the board in chemistry in order to investigate chemicals and so forth. So, the first slide here has the base units, what are called the base units, uh, or SI base units. Now, this SI means international system of units, which means scientists all over the world will use these units. So the first one is measure of length. Anytime you want to measure the length of something, we will use meter. Now you've probably heard or have seen a meter stick. A meter stick is roughly uh, the size of a baseball bat. That's a good way of remembering it. It's same as your yardstick. A yardstick is actually a little shorter than a meter stick, but roughly the same. For mass, we're going to use the kilogram. A kilogram is about how much a big textbook weighs, like a school textbook. Time, we'll use seconds. All of you guys should be familiar with uh, seconds. Everyone essentially uses seconds all across the world. Uh, for temperature, we're actually going to use Kelvin. Now, we're going to get into Kelvin a little more later. No worry, uh, don't worry about it now but essentially it's related to Celsius, degrees Celsius. And then for amount, or anytime we want to know how many of a chemical, we'll use something called the mole. So a few of these we'll actually discover later as we go along. Uh, but this is, um, you can see that, for example, with the kilogram, we don't use kilogram for our mass here in America, but the rest of the world, including the scientific world, will use it. So. Going on to the second slide, <clears throat> the difference between mass and weight. This is an important difference. Mass is a measure of how much matter is contained in a, in a body, and it's measured by a balance. So here is your balance. Uh, a balance, as opposed to a scale, a scale is actually uh, like your bathroom scale, or in this case, uh, a little laboratory scale. A balance, you would put something, a weight, on one side of the balance, and then your sample on the other side of the balance wait until it balances out. So this is measured measuring mass. Now weight actually has the uh, component in it uh, that has to deal with gravity. So weight is a measure of the gravitational pull on matter. Now the way to think of the difference here, think if you were to take um, a balance onto the moon. So take it to the moon and think to yourself, if you step on a balance, or in this case, I'm sorry, a scale, if you step on a scale on the moon, will you weigh the same? And the answer is you will not. You will weigh about a third as much as you weigh here on Earth because gravity on the moon is actually less. If, however, you take a, a balance to the moon, you'll see that you weigh the same on the Earth as you do on the moon. In terms, you'll have to balance yourself with the same amount of stuff on the Earth as on the moon, and that is kind of the difference. <coughs> Usually the units, again, are kilograms. We can also use grams. On to the next one. Volume. Let's talk about volume real quick. Uh, volume is also uh, an important measurement in chemistry. So it's the amount of space occupied by an object. So if you want to know how much space or how much volume a die occupies, you can measure that. Usually, if it's a solid, we'll use meters cubed. This is called meters cubed or centimeters cubed. And uh, if it's a liquid, we'll use something called milliliters and liters. This is a customary way of doing it. So a quick little question, how would you measure the uh, volume of these objects? For a dice, you can actually measure the length, the height, and the width. So you can do length times width times height. So you measure this distance, you measure this distance, and then the height, and you multiply the three together. If you know a cube, the volume of a cube is length times width times height. You can do a similar thing for this penny. You can measure, uh, in this case, you would have to measure the circumference, not circumference, but the radius from the middle to the outside. If you measure the radius, then you can use a formula, pi r squared. We've learned this in, uh, in math, hopefully. Uh, and that will give you the area of the penny. Then you can multiply this by the height. The height essentially is the thickness of this penny, and you can get the volume that way. If you want to measure the volume of something like a key, which is a very irregularly shaped object, you could try to measure you know, the height and the length and the width 
but it'll be pretty tough to come up with a formula. What we would do in this case is actually we would do what's called water displacement. You may have heard about this. You would actually drop the key in some water and then see how much the water level goes up by. And that difference is going to be the volume. And we'll work with this in class. This is water displacement. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Let's talk about prefixes. Very often these uh, measurables, things we measure, um, if, if the units uh, are pretty big or pretty small, we'll actually use prefixes to help us out. So the, the prefixes here are kilo. A kilo, it actually means thousand. Kilo is a thousand. Centi would be one hundredth. This is actually one, same thing as one hundredth. This, is, this one is actually in the hundredths place. Milli is one thousandth, one thousandths place. Micro, and this little um, symbol that we're using is actually a Greek letter mu. Don't worry about it if you can't, the reason you can't recognize it, it's from a different alphabet. And this is the millionth place, this is one millionth. And finally, nano, the smallest, is one billionth. And these prefixes can apply to any unit. So, for example, you can have a kilogram, you can have a kilometer, you can have a centigram, centimeter, you can have a millisecond, and so on and so forth. We're actually going to apply these here. So, in the next slide, we're going to do an example. In this case, we're asking how much, how many centimeters are in a meter. Well, because centi actually means one hundredth, you can hear the word cent, like a hundred cents in a dollar, or a century having a hundred years cent would be 100. However, what we'll say is that one meter is 100 centimeters, or we can conversely say that one centimeter is 100 of a meter, or 0.01 meters. This is saying the same thing. Uh, in this first example, we're doing it from the perspective of a meter. A big meter stick, you can say, has 100 centimeters on it. But then if you're one of these tiny little centimeters, then you're 100th of a meter. And the way we write 100, is point zero point zero one. If you put the zero in front of the decimal, you get the same number of zeros as you do in the 100. So I don't know if that makes sense. Hopefully, you can wrap your head around that. Same thing with a kilogram. A kilogram has a thousand grams. The prefix kilo means thousand. If you look at it from the perspective of a gram, then a gram is one thousandth of a kilogram. In this case, point zero zero one or one thousandth of a kilogram. So in the next slide, I want you guys to try the example yourself. Go ahead and pause the video and try to do the same thing, and we'll go through it in the class. If the units are uh, derived, if you have more than one unit combined together, these are called derived units. And these are simple uh, to spot. Anytime you have more than one, notice we have grams and centimeters. Even if you have a cubed, that means you have centimeters three times. Um, and energy, notice how big this derived unit is don't have to memorize these derived units, just realize derived means combination of base units. Okay, we're going to finish up by talking about uh, two things, and that is accuracy and precision in measurement. Now, accuracy is actually how close the measurements are to the correct value, how accurate you are. Precision, how close they are to one another. So notice here we have darts, and if the darts are close together, but they don't hit the bullseye, then they are precise. We have a high level of precision. If the darts are close together and they hit a bullseye, they're also accurate. In this case, they're neither. Notice they're not close together and they're not uh, hitting the bullseye. So that's accuracy and precision. In the next slide, we're actually going to show you an example of this. We have three measurements, 1.31, 127, 129. Notice how close these measurements are to each other. And if they are close to each other, then they are precise. So are these measurements precise? Yes, they are precise. Are the measurements accurate? Well, the measurements actually don't match the real value, which means they are not accurate. So these three measurements are precise, but not accurate. In the next slide, we'll actually show you how to calculate this. So a way to calculate accuracy is to use something called percent error. And the equation for percent error is actually accepted minus experimental divided by accepted times 100. Now, these here are absolute value signs. 
if you remember from math. This means your number will always become positive. If you have a negative number, it will make it into a positive number. Now think about this equation like this. What you're doing is you're trying to find out what is the difference between what I should have gotten, the expected, and what I actually got, the experimental. So you take the difference between those two, and then you divide it by the accepted, what I should have gotten. And then you multiply by 100 because percent actually means per 100. This actually means 100. That's why we're multiplying by 100. Let's go ahead and apply this equation to the next uh, problem. Next slide here. So we have a volume that's measured experimentally at 3.74. What's the percent error? If the correct value is 3.53. So what we'll do is we'll set up our percent error equation, which is we call accepted minus experimental divided by accepted absolute value times 100. Our accepted value is the correct value, which is 3.53. So we got 3.53 minus our experimental value, which is 3.74, and then we'll divide by the accepted value, which again is 3.53, absolute value times 100. So go ahead and try this in your calculator. What you need to do first is you would need to subtract the top, so 3.53 minus 3.74, and only then do you divide by 3.53. Multiply by 100, and do it on your own, pause the video if needed, and hopefully you get negative 5.9%. Now, the absolute value actually gets rid of the negative, and we end up with 5.9. So this would be the answer. Let's do one more concept here. Actually, go ahead and do this on your own. Try this example on your own, the same thing. Pause the video, try it on your own. The last thing we'll do is talk about precision. Uh, the way to mathematically do precision is something called average deviation. And what we do is we have our set of data. Here we have four numbers, four trials. And essentially we're going to compare these trials to our average. We'll have to determine an average. And that's actually what we're going to figure out here in the next slide. The next slide actually shows you the, uh, the three steps. So we'll have to first find the average of the four measurements. You guys have hopefully done averages. Then we'll subtract each average from, or each measurement from the average. And then we're going to average the subtractions or the results from part two. And you'll see exactly what this looks like. And we'll do it here on the last, uh, on this last slide. So let me take you through it. So average deviation, here we have our three or four trials. We went ahead and determined the average of them. And we did this by adding them adding four of them, and then dividing the whole thing by four. We've done this before, and that's how we get 3.0 for the average. Next, we subtracted each one of these from the average. Notice 3.0 minus 2.9 gives you 0 0.1. 3.3 3 minus 3.0 gives you 0.3. And then on and on and on, we have these four deviations. These are our deviations. And the final step is to add the deviations up and then divide by four again, average them out, and that's how we got point two. So this was kind of quick. We went quickly through the video. Expect it to go this quick. That's because you can pause it as needed and uh, rewatch a certain section of it. We will answer questions. We'll actually go through this in class. Don't think that you're supposed to be learning this already. By now, it's supposed to have it 100% learned. But bring this with you to class, and we'll uh, wrap it up there. All right, thanks for watching. Try that again.